All right, if you guys want to turn your Bible, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bibles, I would appreciate it. 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be at the very end of chapter 1. Sorry, i got to do this real quick. We're going to be at the very uh, end of chapter 1, starting verse 2 as well. So go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. We, uh, we were away for some time because of Holy Week, and now we are back at it, working through the book of 1 Peter. And I want to quickly remind you of what this book has been about, what we've seen that this book has been about so far. Peter is writing to Christians, and this could be a mix of Jewish and Gentile Christians, in Asia Minor. A group of Christians in Asia Minor, and they are outcasts in the society in which they live. And he calls them elect exiles. Elect exiles. They are sojourners. This world is not their home. They are not native. They might be native-born people, but not anymore because they've been born again through Jesus Christ. And so they're navigating their life amongst their pagan neighbors Again, as chosen by God, we saw that, elect exiles, they're elect, they're chosen by God, but again, exiles in this world, they are strangers in this world, living in the midst of a culture and a people that do not know Jesus and that often do not want to know Jesus. And the same is true for us. Uh, It's evidently true for us. If you watch the news and just see kind of where the world's going, we are elect exiles. We are elect exiles. The last time we were in here in 1 Peter, we saw the call to holiness. As elect exiles, we are set apart by God, and we, because of that, are called to live lives that are set apart, lives of holiness set apart from those around us. And so we're going to continue in that vein today as we end 1 Peter chapter 1 and start 1 Peter chapter 2. And the, what we're going to see is that we are born again by the Word. Born again by the Word. It's interesting, I don't know if, if you guys have a lot of experience with uh, Islam or the Quran. Um, for me, I have studied Islam a little bit, um, just from my own nerdiness. I was interested and wanted to get an idea of what the second largest religion in the world was about. The church I was at in Augusta, there was talk up for some time that a, a, a mosque was going to go uh, in, uh, was going to move in kind of down the road from us. And so because of that, I, I bought a Quran and read it. I didn't read the whole thing, but I read some parts of it. And I bought a book that kind of walked through the differences between the Christian faith and the uh, Muslim faith. And uh, some years later, I, I found um, an app from the Reformed Theological Seminary where you can listen to all of their lectures on that app. So an entire class you can listen to. And this is how much of a nerd I am. I found a a lecture on Islam, and I listened to the entire thing. It was like 30 lessons on Islam. I was, at the time, I was working, uh, I was working in Portland for a lobster company, and I had a lot of downtime. I just sat there all day, basically. So I just listened to this, to this lecture series on Islam, and I listened to the whole thing, and I I learned a lot. And it's, it's interesting, through that study, and, and through reading the Quran, Muhammad, whenever he refers to Christians, and he refers to other groups, but he does refer to Christians this way, he calls us people of the book. People of the book. And, you know, most of of what I read in the Quran, obviously I do not agree with. There are very important differences there. But I think that Muhammad got that one right. We are called to be people of the book. In fact, I think he probably gives us a little bit more credit than we deserve right? Probably more right than we deserve. Oh, that we would be people of the book. Uh, Today, in our text, we're going to see that for Peter to be a Christian, it is a, it's, it's essential. You must be a person of the book. You have to be a book person. If you say you know Jesus, if you claim to be a Christian, he says in verse 23, then you have been born again by the word of God been born again by the living and abiding word of God. This is the nature of God's word. It is a regenerating word. It is a rebirthing word. 
And for us, whenever we are born again by it, it leads to a lot of things. But here are two things that he points out. It causes us to love and it causes us to long. To love each other and to long for God. And so that's what we're going to consider today as elect exiles. If you are an elect exile, you've been born again by the word to love each other and to long for God. And as always, as we are working through this today, I just want you to consider this question. Is this you? What is your relationship to the Word of God? Do you kind of swing by it from time to time, kind of pass in and stick your head in and say hello and then maybe see you next week? Or do you come to it every single day, just as God said, just as Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God as daily bread? What is your relationship to the Word? Do you see a love for others within you? And specifically, the context is a love for your fellow brothers and sisters in the church. And finally, do you long for God? Do you desire God? Do you crave God? You say, I need Him. Is that you? Peter says, this is elect exiles who've been born again by the Word. And so let's read 1 Peter 22. And we're going to skip over down to chapter 2, verse 3. And just a quick reminder, the, pa- the, the chapters and the verses were put in later, okay? So sometimes we can read it and think because another chapter starts, it's a different idea. That's not the case, especially in today's message. It says this in verse 22, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and all slander, Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Have you tasted that the Lord is good? If you have, then you know He is good. And we first meet with Him in His Word. That's going to start in verse 23 to 25. It says right away that we have been born again by the Word of God. Born again by the Word of God. Now, there's a lot more in there, but that's the initial sort of idea. Being born again by the Word of God. If you remember prior sermons, earlier on in the first chapter here of Peter, we saw similar language. At the very beginning, he said in verse 3 that God has called us, according to His great mercy, to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus. So he says that we are already born again through the resurrection of Jesus, and now he says that we've been born again through the Word. And as I read it, I think, well, which one is it, Peter? Are we born again from the resurrection? Are we born again from the Word? Well, really, it's both. It's both. What does it say in John 1.1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, who is that word? Well, you go down to verse 14, it says, And that word took on flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the word. This gospel message, this good news of the cross and the empty tomb in the person of Jesus is the same thing as the word of God. And it says that explicitly in verse 25, second half, And this word is the good news that was preached to you. It is the Word that gives us life. And that double symbolism there, the Word of God that we read, but also the Word incarnate, Jesus Christ. It's the Word. But whenever Peter says here Word, I don't think he just means that gospel message, although certainly it's the gospel message that saves, that God saves sinners from their sin through His Son. I don't think he just means that by the Word, and I don't think he just means like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John okay, as the word saving us, I think he means all of it, the entire Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, all of it is God's word and all of it saves. 
And that can be difficult, honestly. Whenever I read Leviticus and it talks about, you know, you got to kill this goat and how to kill the bull and you got to smear the blood here. I'm like, how does this? I believe that this is the inspired word of God. But, you know, it's just so strange and different and, and odd. And, and if you know the text, you know that Jesus fulfills all of those requirements of the law. So there's a connection there. But I think there's even more than this. God saves through his word, and he changes us through all of it from Genesis to Revelation. But I think it's it's even more than that, okay? When you read the Bible, you have to understand that you're not just reading words on a page, okay? You are reading words on a page, but it's not just that. There's something more going on here. The Bible instructs us, so you can learn about God, you can learn about yourself, you can learn about right and wrong, you can learn all types of things, but it's not merely a book of instruction. And I would say the Bible is not primarily a book of instruction. And if you come to the Bible primarily as a holy textbook, then you have, you missed it. It's not just a book, okay? It's not just a book. You've fallen short about what Peter means. Again, he says that you have been born again by the Word. There is a power happening whenever you read that is changing who you are on the inside. Whenever, if you've read the book of John, early on in the book of John, Jesus has what we might call a crisis of ministry. And he, he says some really strange things. He, he's developed, a, a large crowd is following him. He, the people see his signs and his miracles and, and, and all of these things, and they're really interested. And then he says, to follow me, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And people are like, what? Who is this weirdo that we started following? And so th- there's a crisis point, and all of these people sort of, there's a mass exodus. They all leave Jesus. And then Jesus turns to his 12 disciples. And I'm just going to read in John 6, 66, 69. And I want you to see how Peter responds, what Peter says to Jesus. It says, From this time, many of Christ's disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And he turns to his disciples and he says, You do not want to leave too, do you? All these people are leaving me. Do you guys want to leave? And look what Peter says. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Elect exiles believe that the Word of God has the power of eternal life. That whenever we meditate on it, whenever we chew on it, whenever we initially receive it and then grow into it, we change. God's Word is his means of changing you, okay? This is how God works. It's the power of God to accomplish his purpose. Carpenters have hammers, sculptors have chisels, and God has his word. This is how he works. Whenever God speaks, things happen. Again, it cannot just be words on a page. Now, many approach it as words on a page, and they leave unchanged because they don't have faith in the Word. But for those who have faith, for those that turn to Jesus and say, these are the words of eternal life, where else am I going to go? Whenever they stay in this Word, whenever the seed comes down and is planted in their soul, they change. And this is how God has shown Himself to work from the beginning. Consider creation. The creation of the universe. In Genesis, how did God create everything? Did he go to the cosmic Home Depot to pick up supplies? No. He spoke it. He said, let there be light. And there was light. Moon, sun, stars, you. And there you are. The point is that God creates through the creative power, explosive power of his word. And he did it at the beginning And he doesn't stop there. He continues. That famous passage in Isaiah, So shall my word be that comes out of my mouth. It shall accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. 
This is why Peter calls it the living word. This is why you were born again. I mean, it, it, it'd have to be more than just words on a page. Hebrews 4.12, the famous passage, for the word of God is living and active. It's the word that gives life. Elect exiles know this. They love the word. They love the word. And if you truly believe this, you ask God, God, come and help me. God, change me. God, give me a sign. God, come and work in this, in this area of my life. You're looking for God to move within your life. What I'm telling you, get in the Word. That's how He's going to do it. This is the means. It's His chisel. It's His hammer. Reading is a life-giving act. Coming to church is a life-giving act. Whenever you listen to a sermon preach, it's a life-giving act. Whenever you get in the Word yourself, whenever you read it with your spouse, whenever you read it to your kids, it's the power of God working in ways unseen. And that's how the kingdom of God works, right? Jesus says that it's like leaven working through dough. And the dough is kneaded, and you, you put the dough there on, on, in, the ba- in, the, uh, in the basket, and it's, you know, it's small, it's not big, and then you come back an hour later, and it's grown. You know how it happened. It just did it. That's how the Word of God is. You have to keep coming to it and keep coming to it and keep coming to it and invest yourself in it and dig into it and you'll find that you will change. But most people just don't have the faith for that. They don't have the faith for that. They want a quick fix. That is not how God works. You have to have the faith in the word to accomplish the work that God has set it for. It's the ones that have dug deep, that have hit the rock, the foundation. These are the people that last. And I'll say as a pastor, just talking with people, I can get a sense if these, are, if these are really word people. Just how they talk, how they approach difficulty, the things that they're seeing down the road, how they consider them, right? They don't view the Bible or the Bible verses as a good luck charm or just something to throw up on, on a Facebook post. That's great to throw it up on Facebook, right? But it's not just that. It's a deep abiding truth. That's it. It's the word of God. God said it, it's going to happen. So that every trial that comes, we have a way forward. I'm not dead, I've been born again. It requires faith, though. Elect exiles, they take the word by faith. And continuing, Peter develops this idea by introducing a metaphor for us. I'm going to read again in verse 23. It says this, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. He compares the word to an imperishable seed, and then he also introduces the perishable seed. So it's a metaphor working. You've got the perishable seed on one side, and you've got the imperishable seed on the other side. And he makes it very clear that the imperishable seed is the word of God. But then what is the perishable seed? Well, he answers that by quoting from Isaiah 40. That's what this is, Isaiah 40. And there's the dichotomy. We have the word, and then the perishable seed would be what, based on verse, four, uh, verse 24 of Isaiah 40? Flesh. Flesh. All flesh is grass. And so what is that? That is just man's natural state. We are all born of perishable seed. This is the natural state of man. You are born, and you will die. You will waste away. This life perishes. It ends. Because the seed is perishable. It, at its core, at its root, at the foundational level, it was made to die. Man will die. And so if you want eternal life, if you want heaven, you need a different seed, right? You need a different seed. Because if, if you're trying to get there, if you're trying to get to heaven, if you're trying to have eternal life, but where you came from is perishable. Your origin is perishable. Why do you th- you'll never get there? You need a different seed. This is why all human means of salvation ultimately fail. The root is all wrong. It's the wrong seed. You can't be good enough. 
You can't do good enough. You can't think good enough. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't merit it. You can't do anything that depends on the power of the flesh. Why? Because it's the perishable seed. Only God can do it. And it's, again, he says, he does it with his word. You're born again. The temporary nature of this world is just well attested to in the Bible. Uh, we think about Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew six nineteen. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Comparing the perishable versus the imperishable. You know, all the things that we collect here in life, and, and I don't want to be a fatalist about this. There's ways to preach that where then you have to go home and sell your house and all your goods and then go live in the jungles of the Amazon and, you know, preach Jesus to the, the natives there. And maybe the Lord wants you to do that. He has called people to do those types of things. It's not bad to have stuff. It's just, does your stuff have you, right? Does your stuff have you? What are you really living for? John gives it this way, a little bit harder nosed. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Okay? So, soul checklist. What do I love? Do you love the things that you have in this world? Well, if that's the case, he gives the diagnosis. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And again, perishable, imperishable, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Why? Why do they abide forever? Because they've been born again. By what? The imperishable seed. Right? The imperishable seed. And so going back to verse 24, all flesh is like grass, and all of its glory like the flower of grass. It's very interesting. You have grass, the flesh, man, just all of us. You look out and you can't really, it all looks the same. You just see grass there. You don't even see the, the blades of grass. You see the, the grass. But what sticks out are the flowers. And so the glory of God is like these things in this world that do stick out, the flowers, okay? This is what Jesus and John are talking about. The pride of life, the desire of the eyes, the treasures of this world, our highest human achievements, everything we deem really spectacular. Uh, I was uh, watching March Madness yesterday and the day before they had the Final Four, okay? One of those teams that's made it to the championship, they're going to be the most impressive, the highest achieving team in the entire country, and their names are going to be written down in the history books as the champions of 2024. They're flowers amongst all the grass of the other teams. They stand out. But what is the end result of both the flower and the grass? The grass withers and the flower falls. In other words, you can be so impressive in this world. You can gain so many things in this world. But if it's not eternal, then what have you gained? What difference is it really between the flower and the grass? There's a difference in the temporary perishable world but not in the eternal imperishable. It all wastes away in the end. They all fail because they are all of the same seed. Now, the context here is really important. These people, they live in the shadow of the greatest empire in the world. That's the Roman Empire, okay? And even by our standards today, we look back in human history, and the Roman Empire is like the greatest empire. It's definitely like top five. Right, if you, were to, if you were to rank them. Maybe not, I don't know, I'm not a history buff. But to me, top five, okay. But what about today? What about the Roman Empire today? 
If you know the, the context, just a few centuries from this time, Rome will fall. And today their Colosseums are crumbling, their statues are in rubble, their temples are a heap. If you were at that time thinking that the Roman Empire would be gone, that would be unthinkable. But 2,000 years later, we talk about how the Roman Empire was, not how it is, because it's not here anymore. Why this is important for us, we are Americans. We are the Rome of our day, right? We are the Rome of our day. We are the greatest, most powerful country in the world, okay? And what, what, what do I mean by greatest is the highest level of, of wealth, and influence in the world. Could you imagine the White House burning down? If you know your history, you know that's already happened once before. It will happen again, maybe not burning down, but it will disappear. Or the Statue of Liberty, could you imagine it crumbling? Okay? The point is not pessimism, the point is perspective. The, the grass and the flower both fell, verse 25, but the, Lord, the word of the Lord remains forever. And so it really is just a reality check. Why are you wasting your life on things that do not matter? If you want eternity, you need the word. For those who receive the imperishable seed, they're born again. And they last forever. You are brought into a kingdom that will never crumble. God made a promise to David in 2 Samuel 7 that he would have a king on his throne forever. The imperishable word leads us to an eternal kingdom. And this would be a comfort to Peter's people that he's writing to as it's a comfort to us. That's the hope of heaven. We are part of a kingdom. I mean, we look around and see everything wasting away in our world, but we're part of a kingdom that will never end. And those who have the seed are a part of that kingdom. It will never pass away. And so this is what elect exiles pursue. If you want this seed, if you want this word, you will be in exile. But you'll be in exile to a country that is wasting away. So you can be a citizen of a kingdom that remains forever. That's good news. You've been born again by the word. But Peter doesn't stop there. But he shows us what this new birth leads to, what we've been born again to do, and that is to love and to long. And so that's what we're going to consider. We've been born again to love one another and born again to long for God. And so let's start with the first one, verse 22 of 1 Peter 1. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Chapter 2, verse 1, So put away all malice, all deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. So the command there is, again, at the end, I want to just say this, just a way to kind of read the Bible. You can get caught up in all these clauses and all these extra bits, but just hone in on the command. And the command comes at the end, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And so that's the command. And we see this command to love kind of twice. It says, love one another there at the end. And then right before, in, in the first half of verse 22, it says, a sincere brotherly love. And so there's, there's two loves going on here, if you read it. We're, called, we're born again to love one another, but he, he gives two different loves. In our English language, we only have one word for love. In the Greek, they had four words for love, okay? I guess they loved more than, than we do or had a deeper understanding of love because they had four different words for it. That word brotherly love is the word Philadelphia, right? City of brotherly love. That is a collegial love, okay? Brotherly love, a close bond, but the second love, the actual command love there, is the word agape. And I'm sure you guys are familiar with that word. It's the deepest, most intense type of love. And so Peter might be using these words interchangeably, or he might be saying, hey, you love like brothers, but 
I want your love to go deeper than that. I want you to have an agape love. I want you to have a deep, affectionate, strong love. This is the love of God. This is a self-sacrificial love. This says, I am going to love you no matter what, no strings attached, even if it means I die, I love you. And that's the love of the Father, right? That's the love of the Son. He loved to death. He loved in our place. This is what you've been born again to do by the word. You've been born again to love one another. Now, there's more going on here. And I love, I love verses like this because it's like a journey. Notice how we get to that type of love. How do we get to the type of love that just abandons all self? I love you no matter what. How do we get there? Well, he says in verse 22, having purified your souls, okay? So you just don't get there with all this gunk and nastiness in your soul. You've got to purify your soul. And if you go to the command, again, it says, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Now, that brings us another question. How do we get a pure heart? I mean, he says you got to love from a pure heart. You purified your soul. The implication is that your heart isn't pure. It's messed up. It's jacked up. It's got all this other stuff in there. How do we get to a, a pure heart? Maybe there's like a, one of those Brita filters. You guys know what I'm talking about? The Brita filters for the heart. A heart, a soul Brita filter. You put, we got one of those for uh, um, Christmas or something like that. You put the water in the top of the container, and then it trickles down and filters, and the water comes down. It tastes all the same to me. I, I, I've never thought it tasted differently. One time, I was pouring the water in, and then it filtered down, and I drank the water. And then I looked in the top container. There's a dead moth in there. Yeah. It's like, I really hope this thing works. I really hope this thing works. Okay. I don't remember getting sick, so. But is that what we need? Can we create anything that will purify our hearts? Well, no, there's no such thing as obviously a heart Brita filter. How then do we get a pure heart? Well, he says it right here. Having purified your hearts, purified your souls, how? By obedience. To what? To the truth. Again, the Word of God. You've been born again by the Word. You have the Word. It's implanted to your heart. Now the Word is working on you. And as you're walking in obedience to it, it changes you. This is just the natural progression of those who have been caught by the Word. They love others. This is what happens. By your obedience to the truth, the Word in action, born again by the Word, this is what happens. Now, I love this word obedience. I learned this this week, which is really cool. Uh, I got a commentary by R.C. Sproul. And he said the word obedience in the Greek is a combo word. It's hupakae, okay? I, I don't know Greek. I'm just, he could be totally lying. And so now I'm lying to you if he was lying to me. I'm assuming he wasn't. But hupakae in the Greek is a combo word. The first part is hyper, like hyperactive. The second part is the word for hearing, okay? So obedience literally is hyper-hearing. God wants hyper-hearers. He doesn't want people to just hear the truth, but He wants people that do the truth. They hear it so much, they live it out. Because you can come here and listen to these sermons, you can get in the Word, you can do all of that, and not actually do it. And what use are you? Jesus Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Luke eleven twenty eight. 28. It's not enough just here. You've got to do it. That's what James says. Faith without works is dead. Your faith is dead. I watched a video the other day of a guy who was camping. He had this sort of plastic bag, and he was demoing this, uh, this camping gear. And so this bag he took, and he was next to a pond. It was more like a mud puddle. It was so dirty. And he got the water in there. Then he added this additive, some type of additive. And then immediately, all the dirt and the muck and the filth just started sort of coming together. 
and settling at the bottom. And then he capped it off, he, cut it, he, he clipped it off, and then he expelled all the, all the muck, and then he did it again and again and again, and this dirt brown water became absolutely, totally clear as crystal. And what Peter's saying is that is what happens to your heart. Whenever, not only do you get the word, but you walk in obedience to it, the muck and the filth of the heart just goes away. It is expelled, it's pushed out, and it has to, because this is the nature of the word. This is how God works. Self-centeredness, pride, ego, fear, he gets rid of all of it. He expels it from your soul. That's incredible. You can't buy anything that's going to do that. It's offered to you freely. You aren't at the center of your universe anymore. Jesus is. And what it does, it's a radical reorientation of the soul. It's so freeing that you're not about yourself anymore. You'll be surprised how, how fully you're able to love others. Right? That's, the, again, the effect of the word on people. Whenever they realize that they've been saved based on nothing that they've done, purely by the grace and mercy of God, the Father, the love poured out into their souls, and they think, how could I not understand what I've received in Jesus Christ? I see that love in my wife all the time. Our neighbor is, has cancer, and she's wasting away. I went over the other day, and she's, just, she's 70 pounds right now. She's probably less than that. Hannah makes a meal for them every single week. And I, I bring it over or she brings it over every single week. Where does that come from? Hannah is an amazing woman because she has an amazing God who's changed her heart. And now she pours out that love completely, no strings attached, Christ's love in you. And so this is the instruction if we go down chapter 2, verse 1. He says, Put away then all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, and envy and slander. What do these have in common? They destroy relationships. If you're deceitful, you're not going to be able to love others. If you slander people, if you're envious, you're not going to love them. It's going to break and destroy your relationship with them. They sow seeds of contention. He says, put them all away. Literally, it means take off those clothes. As Christians, we have been given new clothes. We are clothed in Christ, right? Put on the clothes of Christ. Take off the clothes of malice, envy, deceit, and slander. And live out the born-again nature of your soul. This is how you are to love others as you walk in obedience to the truth. And so, again, if you, you know, how am I more loving? How can I love this person, right? Unlovable people, how can I do that? God says, obedience to my word. That's how. You can't just try really hard. You've got to walk in obedience to the word. And that brings us, lastly, we're born again to love, and finally, we're born again to long for God. To long for God. Verse 2 and 3. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Here we get a metaphor of a nursing child. Uh, one strange emotion I had that I registered for our first, my first daughter, um, Ellie, that was born, but I experienced every other time with all, the, all of my kids, was the feeling of not being wanted, okay? And I don't say it in a negative way, it's just, it's just the truth. Those first few months, that baby does not want dad, all right? And it's still kind of the case today because the kids always want mom. And I don't blame them. I, I want Hannah too. She's awesome. But the baby does not want the dad. Not in a negative way, just in a truth way. The new baby wants the mom because the new baby wants to feed. The new baby needs milk. That's all the new baby does. Those first several months, you she feeds, she sleeps, she poops on repeat all hours of the day and night. Once that baby is born, uh, it's just an incredible experience having kids. But, you know, you don't know what time it is. You're in the 
in the hospital. It could be 1 p.m. It could be 1 a.m. Who knows, right? It's all a daze. And then in through the door comes the nurses and the doctors, but then one person you meet is the lactation consultant, especially for new moms, because it's so important that baby learns how to nurse, and the mom with the child learns how to do that. Because if the baby doesn't get the milk, the baby's not going to live. The baby's not going to grow. And you know, the baby, the reason the baby is not going get, to get the milk is not because the baby doesn't desire it. The desire's there. That instinct is there because that is its life. This is how Peter describes us. You are to long desire for that spiritual milk because it is your life. Now, what is the spiritual milk? And I think most people say it's the Word, and I think you can say it's the Word, but I think it's more than that. I think it's just the new life you have. I think it's God. It's all that God is. If you go to verse 3, it says, again, long for spiritual milk, verse 3, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. If you've tasted that the Lord is good. He's quoting Psalm 34, verse 8. You're tasting God. You long for God. This is one of those things that you just can't fake. I remember growing up before I really got it. My dad was a pastor, and I, so I grew up in church. And, you know, it's, you know who, who do you love the most, right? Yeah, I think about that question. Well, you love your family, and you love your, your siblings, and you love all these people, but who are you supposed to love the most? And you're supposed to say God. And I remember thinking about that before I really knew Jesus, that I know there's things I'm supposed to say, so I'll say it. But whether it's actually true or not is a different reality. Those who have been born again by the word, they say they love God more than anything else, and they actually mean it. They long for him. They crave him. They come to church because that's where God is. Not because they're supposed to. They just want to be with God. They get in the word because that's where God is. They come in prayer because that's where God is. They're on mission for him because that's where God is. They long for him. This helps us not to confuse ourselves. The Pharisees were so broken and busted. They were doing all these religious things, but just to be seen by others. The goal was not God. The goal was their own pride, their own ego, all of that. It helps us. God is the goal. Psalm 42, verse 1, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. This is not about spiritual maturity, someone going from immaturity to to maturity, like, you know, a a newborn baby growing. That's not what's in view. It's the desire of the baby for their life. Is that how you desire God? Do you have a longing for your life? There's a purpose for that. If you read again in verse 3, that by it you may grow up into salvation. The nursing child desires what will grow her if you have been born again by the word you will desire what is going to grow you as a pastor i I think about that you know we we try to do things and invite people into things and sometimes it's like pulling teeth guys some some of you guys to come and do stuff or not not you not you guys other people right but just discipling people you know through my time ministry and i'm looking do you want it I, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promise you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you this word because I know in it is your life. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to invite you to pray. I'm going to call you to serve. I'm going to do all these things because in it is your life. And it's like a dead person for some people. And if it's like that over and over again, then maybe you haven't been born again by the word. If there's no spark of desire for God and where He is, then maybe you haven't been born again by the Word. Because those who have, that's what they want. They don't want the things of this world. They've tasted what the world offers. They don't want it. It doesn't taste good anymore. It's bitter. It's bland. It's unsatisfying. Right? Those who sit down at the banquet table of the Lord, they never leave unsatisfied. They sit down and they eat and they get all of it and they get more and they get more and they get more and they say more, more and there is always more. That's the telltale sign for me of those who have truly been born again by the word. Do you want them? Elect exiles. 
They are word people. They've been born again by the word. They have new life. They love each other. They long for God. And as we end, I just bring the questions to you. Is this you? I mean, it really is that simple. Everything that I said, is it you? You could begin and end. That's something you just chew on. Do you know the word? Do you live in the word? Do you love God's people? Has the muck and the nastiness and the self uh, conceit and the ego and the pride, has that been purified from you because you're walking in obedience? Do you long for God? Have you really gotten a taste? And I think that's a lot of people. They think they know God, but they, just, they haven't tasted Him. They haven't tasted Him. You don't know Him. Because if you truly have, you don't want anything else. I pray that the Lord would convict you where conviction needs to come, encourage you where encouragement needs to come, change all of us where change needs to come. He is good. He's so good. I pray you would taste and see that. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you again for this word. It's, it's our change, God. It's, it's the power of God for salvation. It's incredible that you would choose to do that through the spoken message, through your son, that you would change our hearts also, that you would invite us in to love like you love, that as you longed, Lord, to show your glory through the gospel, you invite us into that. You change our heart's desires. This is how you do it. I just want to pray for everyone here, God. I don't know where these folks are at with you. I don't know they're anything like that, Lord. I don't know any of that, God. But you do. You know it all. So come right now as we pray and we respond and bring the conviction that only the Holy Spirit can bring. Reveal, Lord, where eyes are blind, where ears are deaf, Lord. Just open all that up and do something only you can do. We're going to respond, Lord, in prayer to you now. Say, great are you, Lord. We invite you to come and work. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.